everybody, my name's Courtney, and we are so excited that you're here with us today. Here are some upcoming events around the church you may want to know about. At PC3, we believe that we are better together. And as we serve in community, we not only get to share the love of Christ as a family, but we experience the grace of God in our own lives as well. We want to invite you in to serve with us. Stop by any of our interest tables after the service, and our volunteers and staff would love to chat with you about joining a team. Good morning, church. My name is Carson. Happy Father's Day to all of our fathers in the room. Yeah, we, uh, we are really, really excited that you're here on Father's Day. It's such a special day. Uh, I believe it, the day is designed to celebrate, uh, to give thanks and to, to, to really celebrate the role that fathers play in all of our lives, but also Father's Day is a, is a day of meaning. It brings back memories or it brings back hard memories or, or reminds us of maybe a season that we're in that is a little bit less than easy. Uh, so today, no matter where you are, I wanna encourage you uh, with that, that your, your God, your God in heaven is a perfect heavenly father. So Father's Day for you can be about your earthly dad and, and grateful for your earthly dad, but it can also be a day to give thanks and rejoice and stand in the fact that your God in heaven is firmly and unquestionably in love with you and that there's nothing that is ever gonna change that fact for you. So I believe that's something for us to celebrate today. I also wanna just recognize that fatherhood is not limited to a biological connection. Fatherhood is far more a relationship. And I believe God models that very beautifully through his son, Jesus. John actually records Jesus saying, if you've seen me, you've seen the father. In other words, if you've seen how I live, you've seen how God operates and how God thinks of you. And Jesus walked the world with unprecedented love and compassion for every single human he came in contact with. So I believe we can rest in that today on this Father's Day, that our God in heaven is so in love with us and there is nothing that is ever gonna change that. So to all of our fathers in the room here, please keep being you, keep serving your families. You are doing a great job, run the race, keep your heart firmly set after God and the way that he led his life or or lived his life because I really believe that is a life worth living. We're getting ready to worship that God together and we're getting ready to sing about his magnificent love and what he did for us and what he is actually currently doing with us, through us and for us. But before we do that, we're gonna stand together and we're gonna introduce ourselves to the people beside us. And I wanna encourage you with something really quick. You can go ahead and stand as we get here. I I want you to remember that we are a family and we don't wanna be a family that just sits at the dining room table and doesn't really actually get to know the people that we're sitting beside, amen? So what we wanna do today is we want you to give your name to the person standing beside you and encourage them and be a carrier of God's love and then we'll worship him together. Yeah, like Carson said, we're gonna worship the God whose love is unprecedented and whose grace is great. So we invite you to raise your voice with us as we sing to him together. From the darkness I called your name And into darkness your mercy came You called me out You lifted me up, how great is your love. You bore my weakness, you took my shame. 
Bearing my burdens in fields of grace You called me out, you lifted me up How great is your love
Before I spoke a word, you were singing over me. You have been so, so good to me. Before I took a breath, you breathed your life in me. You have been so, so kind to me. And oh,
of Jesus, the keeper of peace. Peace is a promise he keeps. presence all anxiety bows because there's no other name like your name there's no other love like your love a love so true and so powerful but father i just pray as we sit here and we just breathe god we, we remind us of the peace that is always in us god i'm thankful that your peace is not dependent on the external circumstances in our lives but it is always available so i speak to the one in this room right now that is feeling that anxious soul and that's feeling um, in the midst of the chaos, God, I pray that you would remind him right here, right now, that you are with us and in your presence, there is peace available for every single one of us. And that all anxiety can bow because nothing can stand against your name. We rest in that, Jesus. God, we, we sit still and we know that you are God. And when we sit still, we're able to see just a little bit clearer of who you are. And when we know who you are, we're able to see through those lens. So God, I pray that in this morning, I pray for the one that is having a hard time understanding your character and knowing who you are. God, would you remind him that you are a mighty warrior? God, that you would remind him that you are Jehovah Shalom and that you are there for them. God, I pray that we would look through those lens in every single circumstances and every single moment. We thank you for this time to just worship you, God, the God who is worthy of all of our praise. And in Jesus' name, amen. Thank you guys so much for singing. You may have a seat for just a moment.
That's powerful. The fact that anxiety bows to the very presence of our God is not only something to celebrate, it's something to hold on to. And I pray very earnestly for the person in the room that really needed to hear that, to sing that, and to declare that over their life today. I hope that you do that. I hope that all of us can begin to walk in the way of peace because Jesus came to give it to us for free. I hope that we walk in that. I hope that that changes every experience that we have on this earth because I believe that it does. It's powerful. Something we want to invite you into today as just our church family is something you're probably familiar with that we do around the church every summer. We have summer camps. We have summer camps for uh, kindergarten through fifth grade uh, age children as well as middle school and high school students. And it, all, it seems like every summer camps come a lot faster every year and that there's always a camp going on. It's kind of like the summer marathon for our staff and volunteer teams. But every single year when we get done with camps, there's sometimes a question, do, should we do camp? And the, the answer is always yes. Not because of the work, not because of the resources, but because of the life change that comes to kids' lives when they go to camp and they learn about the real person of Jesus and the fact that he is in love with them. They fall in love with their God. They don't fall in love with a religion or a rule system. They fall in love with the fact that Jesus came for them individually. So what we wanna do as a church is be very specific in our prayer and, our, and in our thinking about the, the kids, the staff, and the volunteers that are gonna be going to camp even as early as this coming week. So we've done this the past couple of years out in the atrium, outside of those doors to the left, there are a bunch of names hanging on string in there. Every name of every child going to camp, every staff member, every volunteer, anybody from this family that is going to camp this summer is out there. And what we wanna challenge and invite you into is for you to go grab a card. And like I said, you can grab any name that's hanging out there. And what we wanna invite you into is to pray for them. Pray for them very specifically. Put this in front of you every single day over the next several weeks or a couple months as they go to camp and be very intentional. I believe when you pray for them, God's not only gonna do something in their life, God's gonna do something in your life. We worship an extraordinary God and he uses ordinary circumstances to do extraordinary things every single time. So I've got Bryn Mason, a very good friend of mine's daughter's name. This is her first year going to camp and she needs us. Their family needs us. Their family needs their church to be standing rooted with them as they send their kid to camp to explore who and what God really is. So I wanna invite everybody into that. I really would ask that you would do that when you head out the service at the end, at the end of our time here together, that you would grab a name and that you would pray for that name over the next couple of weeks. Uh, the host team can come down and we're gonna just invite them to receive our offering. We do this every week and I would just invite you to continue what we just did. We just worshiped our God with our voice. Giving is just another extension of that. And you, the cool thing about our church is when we give, we're able to be a part of so many different things and so many different people's lives being changed forever. And then Mike will be out for week four of a series called A Thousand Little Things.
Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Happy Father's Day to all of you dads in the room. It's uh, good to be here. The uh, last couple of weeks, um, I've been able to uh, sit out there and uh, last week I sat over in that corner and then last week I sat back in that corner and I got to sit down there with my Bible and my notebook and take notes. And uh, I think I decided I like being out there better than I like being up here. It's kind of nice. Um, but I'm glad to be, to be here doing this uh, together tonight, and we're going to uh, wrap up a series we've uh, been calling A Thousand Little Things. Uh, though the series is kind of coming to a close, we're going to continue to use this um, as a way of thinking, uh, to embed this into the culture of who we are as a church um, over the remaining summer. And we'll be telling you more about that um, at the end um, of, our, of our time. We're going to be looking tonight um, in Luke chapter 12, if you have your Bible or if you have your phone, you want to look along, we're going to be reading a, about eight verses of, of a parable that Jesus tells and kind of plowing through some of it. And I'll tell you why in just a minute. Um, well, I'll tell you why right now. Um, one of the things that has been on my heart uh, as a church, uh, just in terms of what I feel responsible for, um, we've been talking a lot about learning together. Uh, we're on this kind of collective corporate uh, learning curve. We're learning about what it means to live life with Jesus in a culture that is rapidly changing right in front of us. The, the pressures, the, the issues that we are facing are changing just, I mean, rapidly. The last two or three years, the issues that we deal with from middle school parents and, and elementary school parents and just the, the general things that come into our, uh, our office and into our span of care are just, it's increasing. It's faster, it's, uh, it's ever-changing. And so we're on a really steep learning curve to learn what it looks like to be the body of Christ in a world that desperately needs it. And um, also, you know, we've been talking a lot about the kingdom of God to learn how to live in this, this kingdom, this rule and this reign right here, right now, inside of another culture that isn't the culture that we long for and how we make a difference in that and how we uh, are effective in bringing God's kingdom come uh, on earth as it is in heaven. So those are the kind of things we're learning about um, together. And part of that uh, exploration has been doing some intentional stuff with our staff. And one of the, um, one of the things that we've done is we, uh, about the last six or eight weeks, we did uh, inside of our staff uh, what we call a communication cohort. And this is essentially a group of men and women who are on our staff who are interested, who are called, who have giftedness in communicating and teaching and communicating uh, in various uh, places and to work together to learn and develop a more cohesive voice for our church. And so it's been a lot of fun. I've learned a lot. And part of that exercise was a six week curriculum that concluded with each person having to turn in a thousand word essay on a particular topic and then to stand up here on this stage with a video camera and teach a 10 to 12 minute talk. Uh, in front of six of their peers. You can imagine how terrifying that is. Um, so you're standing up here all by yourself, the camera's on you, and you're teaching to like seven people sitting out uh, in this big auditorium just like this. And so we were doing that, and then we would uh, offer feedback and learn together, and that's what it is. So um, part of what uh, my, my role is, whenever I'm doing things like this or involving things like this, it's very easy to get into sort of critique mode or feedback mode where you're listening and you're trying to discern and, and make sure you, you catch everything. But my, my posture is always learn first, critique second. It's always learn first, critique second. When you go to a, a, a show or a concert or a conference or whatever, always one of there going, how they do this, why they do that, what they do. I always posture myself to learn first and critique second. It's just been a helpful exercise for me personally. So I sat there listening to each of these six men and women uh, give a talk. And I sat there on my notepad and I certainly paid attention. I'm gonna watch the videos back, but I was just listening to them and what they were teaching and, and what they were saying. And one of, our, uh, one of the guys in the group, his name is Tony Ripa. Tony, you might be familiar with his voice if you uh, follow along our online devotions. Tony writes the majority of our devotions, does an incredible job. And many people I know follow along, read and participate uh, in their walks with Christ through that. He's done a great job of that. So he was up here giving his talk and he used a passage from Matthew chapter 11, verse 28 and 30, which, which a lot of people are familiar with. I'm familiar with it. So when he's opened up and he said, I wanna talk about Matthew 11, uh, chapter 28 and 30. I know what it says. And he spoke it and he quoted it to us. Come to me, all you who are weary laden. Come to me, all you who are weary laden. You will find rest for your souls. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me for my burden is easy and my yoke is light. 
And so as he's like talking about this, I'm writing this down. He says, you know, come to me, all you who are weary, laden, and I will, you'll find rest for your souls. Uh, take my yoke upon me and learn from me, for I'm humble in heart. And he read this whole thing. And he said, there are three words that are really important. I'm going, come to me. That's what I wrote down. He said, and those three words are not come to me. So I scratched it out. And he said, the three most important words in that passage aren't come to me, but they're learn from me. I remember thinking, what does it mean for us to learn from Jesus? What does it mean for us to learn together from Jesus? How do we do this? And tonight, that's actually what we're gonna embark on. We're gonna try to do this, to sense and see what is it that God wants to say to us. In this passage from Luke chapter 12, um, there's a really famous verse in there that some of you may be familiar with. You've probably heard it used or paraphrased in a lot of different places. And it says that to whom much is given, much is required. It's usually a, 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 a principle that's used to say, hey, you've been given a lot, so you're responsible for a lot. You owe people a lot. You need to do something with what you've been given. It's kind of a charge, and it's not a bad charge, but I think there's more to it than that. Too much is given, much will be required. So I sat down in my journal, I began to tinker on this and think about this. And I said, there are essentially two things that we've got to come to grips with when we think about this. If it says to whom much is given, much will be required, then we need to understand what is it that's been given to us? What is it that's been given to you? What is it you have received? And most of us start looking and around, we kind of start to figure this out. And we've taught this the last few weeks. Part of the, the review for this, you know, kind of concluding tonight is we've been talking about don't, do, don't get caught up trying to do big things for God. It's, a, it's all about the little things. It's about looking in front and what we have and doing with what we have, being faithful in it. Um, we, we, you know, a lot of us get, get caught up in trying to do big things for God. Anytime you look and see someone who's done anything significant, if you look at that person or this person, say, man, they've done a lot of big things. Either they hit the jackpot or they've just done a thousand little things really well over time. Almost anyone you see who's done anything that you deem significant has done it, not by doing big things, but by doing a thousand little things faithfully and carefully and intentionally and consistently. That's what the kingdom of God is about. It's about you and I walking into this, a thousand little things, not trying to swing for the fences, do the big thing, make the big splash. It's about consistency, doing a thousand little things, faithfully, consistently, with integrity, with intentionality over time. A thousand little things. Last week, Mark talked to us about uh, the fish and the loaves, feeding the 5,000 if you were here, and basically said, we gotta look and see what it is that we have in our hands, and that's really what this is about. What has we've been given? Jesus took this little boy's lunch with some fish and some bread and he broke the bread. He asked God to bless it, the Father to bless it. And then he fed the multitudes with it. As I was kind of noodling on this, I wonder if there was anybody else in that crowd that might've had anything. Maybe they had some Twinkies or I don't know, maybe they had something. But they're out in the crowd and they looked at what they had and they said, oh, I won't offer this because it's not significant. It won't matter anyway. I began to think about what about us? What about you and what about me? How many times we withhold something, not because we're stingy, not because we're not generous, not because we don't care. We just withhold stuff because we don't see it as being valuable or worthy or able to contribute anything anyway. And so we just hold on to it or put it in our pockets or forget about it. He says, what is it you have in your hand? When it says to whom much has been given, much is required. The first question is, what is it you've been given? What is it that you have been given? What do you have in your disposal? Like some of you are going, well, you look at your stuff. It's your house, it's your car, it's your money, it's your stuff, right? But it's more than that. Some of you are in high school or college and you got like a great smile and you're just cool. For some reason, God just decided to give you something that you didn't deserve anyway and you're just cool and everybody likes you and you've been given this. You've been given influence. People look at you, they respond to you, you've been given something. What is it you've been given? Some of you have relational skills. Some of you have business skills. Some of you have all kinds of things. What is it you've been given? What is it you have in your hands that might be available, might be useful to God? What is it you've been given? Too much is given, much is required. And that really brings about the second question, the second idea that we need to look at is what is it that's required of you? And for some of you, you just immediately feel pressure. You immediately feel like you're not doing enough, that you're not smart enough, that you're not strong enough, you're not fast enough, you're not spiritual enough, whatever it is, what's required of you? That's what I wanna look at tonight. That's what I wanna let, let, let Jesus teach us about tonight. So in Luke chapter 12, um, Jesus is kind of on a little bit of a tirade, if you will. Um, it's, it's interesting, I, I've been reading the gospels over and over and over again, just because I've been thinking more and more about the way of Jesus and trying to understand what that means. And it opens up and he's uh, talking about, he's just kind of railing on the Pharisees. Beware of the religious leaders and what they teach you because they teach you one thing they don't do anything about. There's an inconsistency, hypocrisy there. They live in a culture that is dominated by hypocrisy. 
I'll say that's the culture that we live in. We live in a culture that is dominated by hypocrisy. It's, it's not just the Christian you know, church anymore. It's the entire culture. It says one thing, does another. And so he says, I want you to be aware of this because there's something else that matters. He goes on, he says, you can't live your life fearing the opinion of other people. In fact, the way Jesus says it this way, he says, don't fear those who can just kill you. That's kind of funny. Don't, care those, don't fear those who can only kill you. You need to fear the one who holds eternity in his hand. Now, this is one of the things I think is really interesting for our day and age, especially in the church, where there's just a lot of hype. You know, there's a lot of, you know, everybody's trying to make a splash, everybody's trying to make a name, everybody's trying to get everybody excited about all this thing. And hype might get you excited, but that's not what it's about. Hype is about getting you excited. Passion is about what you're willing to suffer for. And this is a much different way of thinking about things. Passion is what you're willing to give your life for, what you're willing to bring yourself and offer yourself for, not just what you're willing to get excited about. There are a lot of people who are willing to get excited about a lot of things. There are very few people who are willing to give themselves for those things. And that's really Jesus' message. He says, I want you to pay attention to the things that matter. So I was reflecting on this, and this is really important because a lot of us pay attention to a lot of things. A lot of us pay attention to a lot of things without any intentionality to it at all. We just are the victims or we're sort of at the disposal of whatever happens to catch our eye. Whatever happens on Instagram, whatever the latest show is, whatever the latest political movement, whoever seems more persuasive or hype-filled than the other person, we latch onto that. And what you need to understand is that whatever catches your eye will eventually catch your heart. What grabs your attention will eventually garner your allegiance. We gotta pay attention to this. And that's what Jesus is saying. He's speaking a lot about this. He says, I want you to pay attention to the signs. I want you to pay attention to what I'm doing. I want you to look at this and begin to see and actually be intentional about what it is that gains or has your attention. What is it that really has your attention? Is it worthy of your attention, the attention that you're giving it? And so he's talking about this. And then he comes on and he, and he finishes up and he says, basically, he's talking about being ready, servants being ready when your master comes. Servants being ready, that you've been given orders and your master says, I want you to be ready to respond when he shows up. Ironically enough, Jesus is preparing his disciples for when he leaves and ascends to the Father, kind of that time between then and when he returns. He says, I want you to be faithful. I want you to be found doing what I've asked you to do. I want you to be ready. I want you to be attentive in this season. I think that's what he's asking of us. And so then Peter asks a question. This is where we're gonna start off our text tonight. Luke chapter 12, Peter asks this question. Here's this question we'll put on the screen. Luke chapter 12, verse 41. Jesus is given this message, pay attention, pay attention, be ready, pay attention. So Peter says, Lord, is this a story for us or is this a story for everyone? It's kind of an interesting question. Jesus, is this one for us or is this for other people? I want you to think about your own life. Some of you have come to church and you've heard a great message and your thought is this, man, that message is so good. I wish Steve or John or Jim or Bob or Sue or Sarah, I wish they'd have heard that. I wish my wife would have heard this. I wish my husband would have heard this. I wish that person would have heard this. Jesus, is this for me or is this for somebody else? Anybody ever heard a great message that someone else needs to hear? All right, don't we do this? We always think, we like, man, that, that message is so good. I wish so-and-so would have heard that. So that's what Peter's asking. Hey, Jesus, is this for them or is this for us? Because I know someone who could really use this story that you're talking about. Because, you know, John over there, he's not as ready as I am. And he starts comparing himself. What's funny is Jesus doesn't even bother answering the question. He just ignores it. I think he's kind of looking at Peter out of the side of his eye, going, that was a dumb question. I'm going to keep talking because I don't want to embarrass you in front of all your friends. And he just keeps going. So Peter's asking this question. Here's why I want you to, to wrestle this. Here's why I think this is important. Because what a lot of us do is we come in and we're always looking for what might apply to someone else. And what Jesus, I think, is doing in this, we're learning from Jesus, right? I think he's inviting you and he's inviting me to see ourselves in this story. He wants you to see yourself in the story, to see where you would put yourself and how you're gonna respond, what you're gonna learn about this. This isn't, isn't for someone else. Now, what you could do is you could find, if you're going, hey, I don't wanna play that game, you can listen to this and you can find where someone else fits in the story. Then you can call them later on this week and say, hey, I got a message you need to hear. And you can share the online uh, link with them and tell them this is a message for you. But for the rest of us, we wanna start looking and seeing where we're gonna see ourselves in this story. So Peter says, hey, is this for me or is this for, uh, for them? And so Jesus just goes on with a story. He says, a faithful and sensible servant is the one whom the master can give the responsibility of managing the other household servants and of feeding them. If the master returns and find that the servant has done a good job, there will be a reward. 
I'll tell you the truth, that the master, uh, that master will then put the servant in charge of all that he owns. I mean, this makes sense, right? If, if you entrust someone to do something and they do it well, the odds are you're gonna let them do something else. I worked at Chick-fil-A growing up and there were people that you could entrust with responsibility. They could say, hey, Mike, I'm going to lunch. Can you watch the back line? Make sure the orders are cooked correctly. Make sure the waitresses and waiters get their food and make sure everything works like it's supposed to. I can do that. I can sit there. There are other people that you would put in charge of that. They would go take a nap on top of the walk-in freezer in the back and the whole place would fall to pieces. That person would be fired and the other person would get promoted, get more responsibility. Does this make sense to us? That's what Jesus is saying. This is a simple illustration he's using. Then he goes on, he says this in verse 45, but what if the servant thinks, my master won't be back for a while, it is time to party. It's really interesting that he uses this 2,000 years ago and it meets us right here in 2019. But what if the servant thinks, oh, my master's gone, it's time to party, and he begins beating the other servants, partying and getting drunk. Do you know anybody who could use that message tonight? This isn't for them, it's for us, right? Remember, See, see how easy it is for us to do that? He says, there's people that will take advantage of responsibility that they're given. There are people who are given things and they will use it to get their own way or to indulge their own desires. I want you to think about that for a minute. Are there things that you have been given, that you have decided, this is for me and I should have the right to use this in whatever way I want to get what I want in this moment for myself? That's what he's talking about. There's, There's these two ways of doing things. But what if this servant thinks he's uh, gone and he starts taking advantage of the other servants, starts um, uh, oppressing them and using them and while he's partying and getting drunk, the master will return, verse 46, will return unannounced and unexpected. He will cut the servant to pieces and banish him with the unfaithful. And we're like, yes, finally, justice for those people. And again, he's reminding us, this is for you. This is you and I finding ourselves in this story. Verse 47, and a servant who knows what the master wants but isn't prepared to carry out those instructions will be severely punished. The person who knows what they're supposed to do and just ignores it or refuses to do it is going to be severely punished. But someone who does not know, but someone who does not know and then does something wrong, they will be punished also, but only lightly. Then here comes this principle. When someone has been given much, much will be required in return. And when someone has been entrusted with much, even more will be required. So we're learning from Jesus. And the parable seems to make sense. People who are faithful kind of get promoted. People who are not faithful get punished. But then he adds this line, to whom much is given, much will be required to whom has been entrusted to much, even more so will be demanded. And we start going, what is he saying? What does this mean for you and me tomorrow and the next day and the next day? Well, I sit down and I write down and I try to use my journal to do this. I can think out loud or think, uh, I guess, uh, out loud is think on paper. I begin to ask myself, what is it that is given? What is it that the servant is given? In the very first part, he says, a faithful and sensible servant. This is the person who can be trusted. This is the person who can be maybe trusted with responsibility. Now, all the adults are going, amen. This is for all of us. He is trusted with responsibility. It's not just that he gets things done. See, a lot of us, we think what we've been given and we hear to whom much is given, much is required. We immediately start thinking about the results or the things that our lives should be achieved, some bullseye somewhere and how quickly we should be there, what we need to do in order to get there. We start thinking about, I've been given this, how am I gonna maximize this to get the maximum results? That's what a lot of us end up thinking this believes. I've been given some gifts. I've been given some money. I've been given something. I gotta maximize that. What's required of me is I gotta maximize this to get maximum results, to do so much with what I have, right? We, we, that's how we tend to think. And I wanna sort of push, I wanna think, keep thinking about this a little bit differently because there are two things that are actually really interesting to me in this passage that kind of push against our current culture. Number one is he says, if you've been given responsibility, you're likely gonna get more responsibility. Now this makes sense to us at face value, but we don't live like this in our culture. 
What most of us think, if we get responsibility now, it should mean that we have less responsibility later. We have phrases in our culture, things like this that say, pay now so we can do what? Play later. We want to do things now so that we don't have to do things later. That's how the world works. I wanna work hard now, save up, get enough retirement so I can do nothing in my later years. So I can retire and do nothing. I can retire and hang out. I can retire and live on the beach or make hammocks or whatever your little pipe dream is. That's what mine is, to make hammocks in St. John. But he says to us, in the kingdom, in the kingdom, responsibility yields more responsibility. If you're faithful with the little things, you're gonna be added, things are gonna be added to you. There's gonna be more responsibility given to you. That feels like pressure, doesn't it? It's like, why would we wanna sign up for that? That feels like more and more and more pressure. But this is how things work. I think we have this sneaky suspicion. I just talked to our staff about this a couple weeks ago. We have this idea. I talked to three or four couples this morning about this. We have this idea that the better we get at what it is that we're doing, the easier it should be. The better we get at being a parent, the better we get at being a husband or a wife, the better we get at our job, the better we get at relational skills, the better we get, at, the better we get, the easier it ought to be. Any teachers in the room? Right? Do you get to be a good teacher and you go, man, I'm a great teacher. I've been teaching for five or 10 or 15 years. I'm a great teacher. And it just gets harder and harder and harder because kids are always crazy no matter how good of a teacher you are. We were talking about this in our church. We were talking about this with a bunch of our, some of our staff members. We were like, man, this is so hard sometimes. Like we're doing, we're making some great decisions. We're making some things and things just are, are, are so hard. And one of our pastors, you'll hear from in just a minute, Rick Schaefer, he said, Mike, we're not making pretzels. Now, I don't mean any offense to anybody pretzel, uh, pretzel makers in here, but we're not making pretzel, pretzels, right? The reason teaching gets harder and harder and harder is because you're not making pretzels. You're actually creating and making another generation. What we're doing, we're making disciples. What we're doing, trying to help you walk with God, we're not making pretzels. We're changing the way people think about the world around them. This is not easy stuff, and it's gonna require increase, increasing responsibility at every, t- at every turn, with every step. Responsibility yields responsibility. The other thing I think is interesting about this is that it says in there that um, if you miss out on something, you're gonna miss out on something. The person who doesn't know what to do and still messes up still bears the consequences. In our culture, we want to do everything we can. If we don't know something, we think we're not responsible for it. Well, I didn't know, so I'm not responsible. It is not so in the kingdom. This is why Jesus' message is to pay attention because there are things that you will miss There are things that you will not see. There are things that you will not be aware of. And we're still, we're still, we're gonna bear the weight or the consequences of even the things that we are unaware of. He says to pay attention. And not only does he tell us to pay attention, he gives us a way in which we can live in this and and live through this every single day. This is really what I want for us to get to because we we go, okay, Mike, that makes no sense. So let's see if we can make some sense of it. So here's what tends to happen. What most of us, let me think about the best way to do this. This is the third service. I'm, I've changed a little bit every time, which is why you love the five o'clock service because it usually is a lot better by the time I get here. <laughs> All right, so when we think, when you walk in here and you think, what does God require of you? Right? To whom much is given, much is required. What do you think that God requires of you? Most of us would almost immediately say something in this vein. God requires, Jesus requires me to be obedient. He requires obedience. Now, real quick disclaimer. Does Jesus require obedience? The answer is yes, he does. So he does. But the question is why? Why is it that he he makes such a big deal about this? Why does he make such a big deal about this? When he gives us responsibility, what he says in that passage is he says that you've been entrusted. What he's actually given you is his trust. And the reason for this is because what trust builds is a relationship. What trust builds is a relationship. So what we have to do is we have to figure out how to connect obedience and trust. Now, this is kind of free because it's Father's Day. My kids, um, 24 or almost 24 and 18, graduate from high school. We're about two months away from being empty nesters. We are, woohoo, we are, we are about ready to celebrate. And um, I love my girls. And, and one of the things that we have learned and we worked on for years and years and years, and this is sort of free for all of you who are parents of toddlers, but it is so important. In our household, when my, when my kids were small, particularly my oldest daughter, we talked about what we called first-time obedience. Now, I didn't learn, I didn't make this up. I heard it was taught this 
from somewhere else. It's not my idea. But first time obedience. First time obedience is exactly what it means, right? First time obedience. They obey the first time you ask them to do something. That sounds like a novel idea, doesn't it? Because most all of us have seen the parenting technique that is anything but that. We, have you ever seen the person in the grocery store going, don't touch that candy, don't touch that candy, don't touch that candy, one, two. I'm like, that's the sixth time you've already said them. So that's actually six, seven, eight, right? 27, 20, they're still counting when they're checking out the grocery store. It doesn't work. First time obedience. First thing is, how do you get your kids to obey you the first time you ask them to do something? See, a lot of us, if you're a parent, you're going, yeah, that's what I'm talking about. My kids should just listen to me the first time I say something. And the problem isn't the kid, it's usually the parent. Because here's how it usually happens. I come home and Michaela or Madison, we'll use Madison. Her shoes are on, the, she was the oldest. Her shoes would be in the living room, be kind of a mess. And you come home and you're tired from work. And rather than looking and giving her a command, you just bark out an order. Pick up your shoes, pick up your shoes. And they go, oh man, dad's mad. We better go hide for a while. And they go and they disappear. And then because you're mad, you just forget about it. And you come back in the living room an hour later, you trip over the shoes. And then what do you do? They're even madder and you bark the order even louder. I told you to pick up your shoes. And then you say something like this. If I've told you once, I've told you a thousand times. And you go, oh my gosh, I'm sounding just like all the things I didn't want to sound like. And it's because you're barking orders, you're not giving commands. First time obedience isn't about getting your kids to comply. It's not about just getting them to do what you said. First time obedience is about something different. See, here's how we did this. When I would come home, what I began to learn is that my children are commanded by God to obey their parents as unto the Lord. That means my commands have the authority of God's word. So when you come home, you say, thou shalt pick up your shoes or you shall surely die for the wages of sin is death, right? You start getting theological on them. But here's what it means. Here's what it means, when I come home and I'm ready to issue a command, I'm not just barking orders, it has an intentionality to it. It has something far greater than I just need you to do what I said. I, this is annoying me, and I need it fixed. It has to do with the fact that I've been given responsibility, I've been given rule over a domain and I'm a steward of it and you as a part of my household are a part of that stewardship. So my commands are always according to a purpose. See, when the master gave the servant those, those, those uh, uh, responsibility in the parable, he wasn't just to get done what, God, what the master wanted done, he was to represent the heart, the intention and the purposes of the master. It wasn't just about getting it done, it was the way in which he would go about doing it. My job in that moment is not to get my kid to pick her shoes up off the floor. My job is to represent the heart of the father according to the responsibility, the authority, and the stewardship that he has given to me in that moment. And so what we began to do is we began, we learned it like this. I would say, and you have to be ready to make them do it. There's no joke. You can't come home and go, I'm gonna ask them to do something and then I'm gonna go do something else. I'm gonna ask them again because if you say first time obedience, you gotta be just as trustworthy as you're asking them to be. If I'm gonna ask you to do something, I'm gonna stay with you until you get it done because they gotta learn how to trust me just like I gotta learn how to trust them. Do you see where this is going? So I come home and I say, hey, I need you to pick up your shoes. Their first response was not to pick up their shoes. Whenever I asked my kids to do something, their first response was not to do what I asked them to do. When I said, hey, Madison, I need you to pick up your shoes, baby. Her first response was to look at me and to say, yes, daddy. Why? Because what you were doing as you are connecting obedience to a relationship, you're connecting it to trust. Yes, daddy, I'm gonna do what you have asked me to do. And now I'm gonna do it, I'm gonna commit to doing it. I'm gonna verbally say, yes, I'm gonna do this because now what happens when they don't do it, they're failing not just to disobey, they're failing to do what they themselves have said to do. You wanna learn how to change a culture. You teach people to do what they say they're gonna do in the smallest, littlest things that will change the trajectory of their lives. So few people learn how to say something and then follow through on what they said. Most of us are using our words to avoid responsibility instead of take it. This is the picture here. This is what he's saying. Whoever's been given responsibility, you're responsible for it. You're responsible for it. So we say yes out of here. If not, if we don't learn it to connect it to trust, it just becomes an obligation. And this is actually the easiest thing to do. Dad, why do you want to pick up your shoes? Just, just pick them up because I said so. Just do what I said. And they learn, oh, I'm just obligated to do whatever he said until I don't have to anymore and then I'm out of here. It's always about connecting it 
to a relationship. It's always about connecting it to trust. I trust you enough to do what it is you've asked me to say. To, uh, sorry, I trust you enough to do what it is that you've asked me to do. That is always the application of the Hebrew word of hear or obey or any of those. It was always action. It was always relation. It was always connected to that. So what happens when obedience comes from trust? Remember, the master who's faithful and sensible is the one who represents the heart or the servant, uh, the faithful and sensible servant is the one who represents the heart of the master and the purposes of the master. He is, in essence, out of the relationship, he becomes a reflection of the presence of the master, even in his absence. So here's another lesson from my kids. And I don't know if you've ever done this, but your kids, like you, they start to get like where they're, they're more adult than they are. Kids are like 11 or 12. They have a mind of their own. They do their own thing. They're starting to become little human beings. And there's that moment where you're like, oh my gosh, I can't believe there's like a, another life-size human being in my house. I remember those feelings very well. And so there was a time, I remember like my kids, they would obey me, right? You, you could, okay, they, they'll clean their room, they'll take the trash, well, they don't take the trash out, but they'll do other things. They do all these other things and you kind of feel pretty good about that. And then you see them talking to an adult, like without your supervision. They're just like, you like see them across the room and they're talking to an adult and you're like, what are they saying? Are they embarrassing me? Are they, and you, and you kind of sneak over there and you can kind of hear them and they like sound intelligent and they sound compassionate, and they sound like normal. And you're like, and you're like, whoa. Like she's, she's an Ashcraft, like she's like, I'm like really, I really feel like, cause it's not that she obeyed you, it's that somehow she reflected all the things that you hoped you've taught them along the way. They become a reflection of who it is that you know them to be. You've got to get it to this part over here or else we will always learn to live out of obligations. And the problem when that happens is that when you live out of obligation, everything becomes about doing in order to get to this place right here. And it's pressure and it's, am I getting this right? It's second guessing, it's all those things. And it just gets to be so hard. Whenever you learn here, what happens is this focuses on what it is that we are to be. What I think Jesus is telling us, and I'll give you this in just a minute. What Jesus is telling us is that to whom much is given, much is required. And it's not the things that you're supposed to do. Now, do you need to do things? Yes, doing is very important. But there's one thing that is required of you, and that is what you need to be. Because a lot of us, when we get into this idea of doing, we start trying to figure out how to use all of these points along the way to get us to here. We're trying to figure out, and some of you are here, and you're trying to figure out how to get to here, and you're consumed with worry and fear and anxiety about what's gonna happen here. You don't even take step one because you can't figure out step eight, and you're stuck. It's interesting, part of the message that Jesus was giving in this whole talk that prompted Peter's question is do not be anxious about tomorrow, O oh, you of little faith. There's only one, and listen, this happens to me. I'll tell you over the years, this has not gotten easier or less pressure being a pastor um, in this church. Um, there are more complicated issues. There are more people things at stake. There are more demands on time. All those things are increasingly true. I drive up here and sometimes you just feel so overwhelmed with all the things that are going on. We're not making pretzels, right? And in that moment, what I always think is something really simple. It's the one thing that God asks of you. It's the one thing that you absolutely have to do in order to live according to what you've been given. You know what it is? The one thing that you have to be and the only thing that you have to be is to be faithful right here. Right here. When I get overwhelmed about what's happening here, I just go, oh, I just gotta be faithful right here. And then guess what happens? The next thing comes, you're like, oh my gosh. And guess what? You just gotta be faithful right there. And the next thing comes, you're like, oh! You just gotta be faithful right there. I've had conversations over the last few weeks with people that said, Mike, 
man, I was right here and I'm like desperate. I don't know what to do. I feel like the weight of the world. I feel like God's called me. I feel like, I feel like he's given me this. And I just don't know what to do. And I say, God, I gotta just trust you. I gotta just trust you. And then I get this overwhelming sense of peace. You ever had that happen? And then as soon as you get that peace, you step into the next thing and it's gone. And he said, it's never permanent. I said, oh, but it is. Oh, but it is. It's the way in which this is designed to work. What we think is that if we were faithful here and we had peace here and we had a sense of, you know, call here, that it's sufficient for over here, but it's not. The faith that you had yesterday and last week is not sufficient for today. It takes being faithful in this moment and being faithful in this moment. His peace meets you right here. It's interesting. If, if we've been given responsibility, you know what's required of us? You know what's required of you? Faith. We walk by faith and not by sight. To whom much is given, much will also be required. Some of you are here and you know what you've been given and you're so afraid to lose it or you're so afraid you won't get your way or you're so afraid if you do this and this is gonna happen, you're looking right here and you're like, oh my gosh, what about these things down here? And you're just going, what do you have in your hands and are you willing to trust me with it? What do you have and are you willing to trust me with it? To whom much is given, the responsibility he has given to you is going to increase. And with the increase of that responsibility, so is the requirement of your faith. But the beautiful thing is, the greater your faith, the more certain you can depend on his increasing faithfulness in your life as well. It's the way this is supposed to work. And it happens when we are faithful in the moment over a thousand little things. I'm gonna take a few minutes here as we close. I know I've gotten longer. I told you it's the five o'clock and I've been off for a couple weeks. It just keeps coming. But we've been talking about just learning a lot around here. And one of, the th one of the voices that has been incredibly important for me personally over the last five years is actually one of our pastors on our staff. And uh, he has helped me and taught me and you know, prompted my thinking around some things and really contributed to that in ways that very few people have. And I wanna take a minute, I wanna bring Rick Schaefer, if he's around here, out here. This is one of our pastors, Rick Schaefer. Y'all can welcome him, Rick Schaefer. Thank you, Rick. Hey, Mike. And um, Rick is, um, we, are, we are in the middle of this, uh, kind of ending this series and starting this emphasis on a thousand little things. We're gonna be using uh, some video teachings and uh, just ways to kind of inject this into um, our culture over the uh, remaining parts of the summer. So Rick, if you wanna take just a minute and tell us about what this thousand little things is and how we're gonna be kind of rolling this out. Okay, yeah, great. So Mike and Mark Follin have been teaching us over the last four weeks about a thousand little things. And when we think about a thousand little things, a lot of times we think about doing stuff. And doing stuff around here, if you've been around here for a long time, you know that we use the word expression for that. And we really try to make the point that um, our lives as Christians isn't just about expression, but that expression comes from a deeper place. That Formation uh, comes before expression and encounter comes before fo uh, formation. So encounter and formation have to precede um, expression. And so that's what these videos are about. Um, we're going to have about nine of them uh, starting next Tuesday. And these videos are only about two and a half to three minutes long. But what we want to do is look at a thousand little things from a, a variety of perspectives from a theological perspective, from a historical perspective, from a cultural perspective, and really look at um, what is it that we do? How does that relate to actually who we are? Some of what you were talking about tonight. Yeah. And if you think about it, you can think about it this way. If you think about my hand as being a plate, um, a lot of times what, what happens is and, and we have a pitcher of water here and we dump it on a plate and it just splatters all over the place. And if your social media is like mine, if you watch the news, 
Um, so much of what we see in culture today is just splatter. <laughs> it just splatters all over. But then imagine that, um, that my hand is a bowl, and we're pouring the water into the bowl, and it fills. And out of the overflow of the bowl, um, it just runs out on culture, out of that overflow. And that's, that's the place that we want to be as a church. We want to be that bowl that's, that's refreshing to culture, that comes from a deeper place than just whatever we hear, we just splatter it out. And so that's, that's what we're going to be doing for the, the next nine weeks or so. Yeah, you know, what a great picture for us, to, for the church to actually be refreshing uh, to the culture instead of sort of the adversary, yeah. um, if you will. I think that's what God is, is calling us to do as a church. Uh, the videos will be out uh, starting this Tuesday. They'll be on all of our social media platforms, uh, uh, Instagram, Twitter, Facebook, and, and all the rest. Um, so you can check them out there. We would love for you because it, it's, it's a us learning things. So if there are things that you see and have questions about, respond. Let's uh, kind of continue the conversation, especially as you travel and, and the attendance patterns over the summer are a little bit different. We want to be able to connect together to what it is that God is, wants to do, not just in this room, but through our church. And that's what we want you guys to be able to understand. So Rick, thank you for kind of leading that charge. I wanted to get you out so people could kind of hear and get familiar with your voice as you'll be hearing from him for the next uh, uh, nine weeks uh, on those videos. So Rick, would you mind closing us with prayer tonight? Yeah, sure. Let's pray. Lord, first of all, we want to come before you and thank you for being here, Lord, for gathering us together with you, for being in our presence. Uh, Lord, it is just an incredible thing to think about the God who uh, spoke the universe into existence and think about uh, you wanting to dwell with us, Lord, to, to want us to be in, in relationship with you, in your presence. And Lord, I pray that, um, that through this, the teaching of this series and through these uh, next several weeks as we keep emphasis on these thousand little things, Lord, that we would just be reminded over and over again that the things that we do come from a deeper place. And Lord, those times when we spend alone with you, those times when we come together and we sing together and we pray together and we hear teaching together and maybe talk about it over lunch and maybe in our groups, even those times, Lord, when we pray for, the, for our kids that are going to camp this summer, all of these things, Lord, are chances for you to fill our bowl and to fill it to overflowing to where um, our homes and our neighborhoods, our community, and even the whole world, Lord, are refreshed by the overflowing of these bowls. Uh, Lord, be with us throughout this week. I pray, God, that we would have just a strong sense of your presence with us. We pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen.